it's true that retiring capacity without replacing it and then having load growth leads to resource adequacy issues. That's, that's just, a, like I said, it's a physical attribute of the system and you can measure the adequacy and we are, we're short. So whose fault is that? I mean, that's a much more complicated question. Coal economics are not good. These plants are hemorrhaging money. And whether or not you believe that we should be subsidizing renewables, you know, coal economics have been getting worse for a couple of decades. And there are good reasons why we're putting pollution equipment on those plants. And, you know, that stuff saves lives. We, we can measure that. Hey, Jeannie. Gabriel. Who's our guest on the Energy Nerd Show? Today, we have Mike O'Boyle from Energy Innovation. Hi, Mike. Hey, Mike. Welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. What are we going to talk about today? Well, um, I think we're going to talk about renewable integration on the grid, maybe a little bit of what California is going through, maybe a little bit of what's going on with the national reliability alarm bells that have been coming up. I just got back from Western NARUC, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, and I think there's a lot of common issues there that, that I observe that states are going through. So maybe California is a bit of a postcard from the future or perhaps a place that everyone needs to pay attention to if they're thinking they're going to decarbonize their grids too. Thanks. Great. Do we start in California? <laughs> We're starting to see some some heat <laughs> out here. Not exactly where I am in San Francisco, but you know, throughout California and the Southwest. We're starting to see hotter and hotter days. You know, tomorrow's the peak of summer. You know, NERC warned that several of the U.S. electricity systems are kind of on the verge of being short if there are extreme enough heat. And so the question of, you know, who's to blame for our current state, but also, you know, does this mean we need to pump the brakes on deploying renewables versus, you know, there's another argument to be made that we made in a recent paper focused on the California grid that actually this this argues for faster procurement of renewables. So maybe I'll ask you to start with uh, your summary of the pump the brakes argument. The most cogent version of that argument, because I think there's a lot of ideology, obviously, in, in the U.S. And unfortunately, even the electricity system, which is a physics-based physical system, has been really politicized. And so, you know, I think any reliability event we've seen since the polar vortexes in the early 2010s, it becomes a Rorschach test for kind of what you see as the main problem with the grid. And this time there was a pretty, I would call it antagonistic op-ed in the Wall Street Journal about how green groups and clean energy and too much coal retirement is to blame for the reliability issues that NERC is forecasting for the summer. So I think the reality is, you know, NERC's job is to measure the reliability of the system, the resource adequacy of the system. And it's not like they're making up the shortages. The shortages are real. And if we had more coal on the system, all other things being equal, no doubt the reserve measurements, the resource adequacy would, would be higher. So to that extent, you know, it's true that retiring capacity without replacing it and then having load growth leads to resource adequacy issues. That's, that's just, a, like I said, it's a physical attribute of the system and you can measure the adequacy and we are, we're short. So whose fault is that? I mean, that's a much more complicated question. Coal economics are not good. These plants are hemorrhaging money and whether or not you believe that we should be subsidizing renewables, you know, coal economics have been getting worse for a couple of decades. And there are good reasons why we're putting pollution equipment on those plants and, you know, that stuff saves lives. We, we can measure that. So, you know, we haven't done a good enough job of making sure that the new crop of resources can come online fast enough, by which I mean, you know, wind and solar and, and storage. And also we have been, I think, collectively slow to figure out what a reliable high renewable system looks like and try to you know, develop market mechanisms that both ensure resource adequacy, recognize the reliability value that renewables and storage and other inverter-based resources that they do provide, but also you know, being realistic about what is the adequacy of our system? How do we ensure it? Because the worst thing that could happen for the clean energy movement is to have rolling blackouts on a consistent basis. I mean, we just can't afford to slow down because of climate change. 
But if renewables are being blamed for better or worse, whether or not it's genuine, that's just going to be detrimental to the speed and scale that we need to achieve. So what would a high renewables, reliable system look like? Yeah, well, um, funny you should ask, Bruce. So we recently completed some work with Grid Lab, and they contracted with uh, an energy system modeler called Telos Energy, headed by Derek Stenslick, who's a national thought leader on resource adequacy and high renewable energy systems. As are the folks at Grid Lab, if you if y'all have and heard of Rick O'Connell and Preeta Sridharan and, and Taylor McNair. They're a great small but mighty team. We did this report which looked at reliability of a California grid that hit 85% carbon-free resources. Right now, California is at about 60%, but it's slated to lose its largest clean electricity source in 2025, the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant, um, which is about, I think, 10 or 12% of the total demand. So this looks at how do you maintain reliability and grow the clean energy share to actually exceed California's current statutory requirements to hit 85% clean by 2030. Right now, the requirement is 60% renewable, which doesn't count large hydro. So you get somewhere in the vicinity of 70% clean as a sort of business as usual. We think, you know, our hypothesis, I suppose, was that wind, solar, and batteries are so cheap and also effective, as has been our hypothesis in other pieces of work, like the 2035 report. I'm just going to start rattling off shameless plugs here. And we wanted to, as opposed to look at the affordability question, really dig deep into the reliability question with this resource mix. So the modelers set up, they use a capacity expansion model to build a resource portfolio. And then they did production cost modeling, which is a running the grid every hour of every year for multiple weather years to see if supply can meet demand in every hour. And it could. The resource mix ended up being, in the business as usual case, really solar and battery heavy. So it is possible to maintain the reliability of the system, but the California grid would have to add, in this sort of business as usual case, somewhere around between 40 and 50 gigawatts of solar, which is double what's on the grid today. I guess it would triple the total, right, in the next eight years. That's a staggering pace. And then add over 10 gigawatts of battery storage. This allows you to really meet the evening peak. It shifts a lot of the daytime solar to the evening where the net peak is um, and helps deal with those difficult hours. But the novel thing that the report did was it took a scenario-based approach to resource adequacy where we stress test the grid. So we took sort of commonly understood scenarios or sensitivities that affect reliability in California and the rest of the West. So rather than take like this probabilistic approach to reliability, where you try to associate a bunch of runs, like rolls of the dice, basically, with a probability of outage, getting like a expected unserved energy, these various metrics that the true energy nerds will be more familiar with than I am. But instead of that, they did a scenario-based approach that just looked at kind of what are the things we're most worried about that create reliability issues and how does the grid perform under those conditions? So like, for example, we looked at what happens if you have the lowest hydro, you know, that California has seen, which is the reality this summer, basically, is, you know, because of the drought, we're going to have all-time low hydro potentially this year, which really affects resource adequacy. What happens if you retire all the coal in the West? Are imports still available? Because California imports about 30% of its energy and it relies on imports a lot during these times of grid stress. What happens if you retire about a third of California's gas fleet? Because like we've seen with the coal fleet, once you put enough renewables on the grid, the economics of the fossil are pretty difficult to pencil out. And you can do things with capacity markets and, and other mechanisms to help prop those resources up if you need them for reliability, but that's a pretty likely scenario. The modelers recreated the temperature and load event of August 2020 when California last had rolling outages. So it was basically like heat dome 2.0, but with a different resource mix just to see you know, how it would do. That's the general gist of it. Oh, you know, the last constraint was limited imports. So, you know, what happens if we can't import as much as we have capacity for? Basically, that was one of the issues in August 2020 as well. Couldn't get enough from, from our neighbors. Did you have increasing electric load for electrification of, you know, home heating and vehicles and all that stuff? That was one of our core scenarios. So we actually let the model build with an accurate load forecast. We didn't have like a surprise electrification. We added a fast electrification scenario on the front end and then asked the model to build a different resource portfolio based on that just to see what it would do to the build rates and whether you know we would have different 
reliability issues. And that's a good point, though. There was, there was also an electrification scenario. So we found no loss of load events unless you restrict imports below sort of historical constraints. So beyond what the model is willing to constrain it, you can artificially constrain imports. And then you start to see that the in-state gas and the in-state renewables are not enough to meet load in just a few hours of the eight weather years. So that sort of argues for greater transparency and sort of more firm contracting if you're going to rely on economic imports for reliability. But generally, the finding was we can keep the lights on. That was an exciting finding. And the downside, right, of doing that is you got to figure out a way to build and interconnect these resources, these bulk system resources, at a sort of unprecedented pace. So what we did as a second scenario was what happens if we diversify? What happens if we add some new renewable resources that we know exist in California but really aren't a part of the core planning scenarios yet? So we added four gigawatts of offshore wind and two gigawatts of geothermal, which generates power around the clock. It's kind of like adding Diablo Canyon back in. And we saw that the build rates for solar are cut almost in half back to sort of the historical maximum, not exceeding it. And it spreads the risk around to different months. It has really positive reliability benefits, but also it really increases the chances that we're going to be able to do it because you don't have to put all your eggs in the solar and storage basket. You can sort of develop all these resources in parallel and reduce your risk of not finding enough land, especially is another risk. So that was our finding, which was pretty exciting. You mentioned the pace of interconnection. And I know in the Northeast, it's already been abysmally slow. I don't know how it is in California, but you, if you need to accelerate the pace, is there actual hope for that happening? I think there's hope. Um, if anyone has not seen the latest interconnection study from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, the growth of the queue versus the amount of resources that are actually interconnecting is staggering. I think there's a terawatt, a thousand gigawatts now of renewable resources and storage in the interconnection queue, which is roughly the amount we need to build to hit President Biden's 80% by 2030 goal. So the resources are there. I don't know if that was a leading question, <laughs> but FERC did just issue a notice of proposed rulemaking about reforming interconnection processes, that should be exciting. I know that was a, a big feature of the advance notice that came out earlier. So there are things that can be done. Whether FERC can accomplish that and get the ISOs and states to adopt these new measures that would actually accelerate the process is another question. But I think in California, there's a growing recognition of the urgency of this problem. So that kind of goes back to when you were saying um, there's kind of a physics aspect of this problem. And, you know, can the grid work and are the resources available? You know, that, and then there's a kind of institutional and um, organizational regulatory planning kind of aspect to this, right? There's, can be politicized and can get, you know, complicated and litigious pretty quickly. Yeah, I totally agree with that characterization. There's few harder nuts to crack than transmission in the United States. So many stakeholders that are affected by transmission lines and cost allocation of those lines and where they're cited and, you know, there are loud and sometimes justifiably angry people that are losing when the pot of winners from these transmission lines is so large and the pot of losers can be quite small and yet those folks have enough power to block entire lines that we really need and that's just been the theme for the last 15 to 20 years and it's really starting to reach a breaking point unfortunately and we need a lot more transmission and to add a lot more new electricity resources to meet our carbon reduction goals affordably. So something's got to give. The processes have lacked transparency, and I think partly on purpose and partly just because of the complexity of enough people understanding issues. But FERC has either a new person or a new office, and it's something like the Office of Public Participation. And they're really, I haven't engaged with them. But maybe if more people knew what was going on and could talk about the benefits to the many millions of people who benefit, maybe would that have an influence? Hope springs eternal, you know, that that would be part of the measure that would sort of help things break through. But there are many venues for sophisticated actors to block progress that I think the Office of Public Participation can help engage people who are genuinely disinterested and try to incorporate their concerns into alternatives. But, you know, people need to also get engaged in specific proceedings where they're affected and, and FERC and the ISOs, they need to find ways to incorporate those folks or there needs to be more leadership at the state level, you know, bringing all the concerns up and engaging. 
I think the ISO engagement processes in some of them seem to be pretty broken. You know, there seems to be like a incumbent power issue. I don't know how else to put it, where new transmission lines, there are winners and losers, and the losers are part of the power structure. And they're voluntary organizations, right? No one forced a lot of these utilities to join these ISOs. They joined voluntarily, and so they have certain rights as a result of that. And monopoly utilities in, in particular that want to protect their native generators, you know, transmission is a really great way to introduce competition to your node where your generator is. And I think that's just a systemic issue. We really do need a bit of more of like top-down transmission planning and siting and, and cost allocation, but in the process, you know, do the very, very best you can to get everyone at the table and settle things out ahead of time. And I, I think that's what FERC is trying to do. I had the privilege of, like I said, going to Western Nehruk in Honolulu. I heard a lot from the Hawaii commissioners about struggling to procure enough solar and storage in a timely fashion by the time their last coal plant retires. And their utility was late, missed a bunch of deadlines. We really can't move quickly enough, but still we're struggling under the weight of this transition a bit. So my takeaway is we got to build a lot more of the new stuff so that we can be confident we can take away the old stuff. So solving these interconnection queue issues, you know, solving and updating resource adequacy metrics and processes, you know, doing some of the stress testing to grow confidence in the reliability of the system like we've done and hope to do more of with GridLab. Those are some of the things that regulators and, and policymakers can think about. But, you know, we really do need to sort of break the queue, solve the interconnection queue issue so we can build these diverse clean energy resources like gangbusters and really start to phase out the fossil permanently. Great. Thanks, Mike, for being on the show. This is a Good conversation and uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, definitely. It's my pleasure to join you. Let me know if you ever want to talk about PBR. You know, I'll be glad to spend time with you on that one too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.